Of uh, course. Gray Muzzle Geekery. Give give the listeners both live and eventually for the recording a little synopsis of what you all do. Well, I mean, long story short, we are, I mean, gray muzzles, depending on what you want to say that age is. Uh, that seems to be up to a hot debate between 30, uh, which is, I guess, typically known as gay death. And then you have <laughs> 35 has been pushed and now 40 is the new 20. And, uh, look, I wasn't a math student. And so <laughs> what happens is that... Um, we are furries, but we're also the type that have a, a variety of history, uh, a variety of like hobbies, uh, LARPers, just flat out comic book nerds and play uh, What other stuff do you like, Dusty? Uh, lots of stuff. <laughs> Thank like, you. Uh, so, LARPing, uh, comics, movies, pop culture. Uh, really quick, uh, you're very hard, you're very quiet. You're, the levels are... Very unequal. Is that I was trying not to pick up Red's oh, mic. <laughs> uh, LARPing, comic books, movies, pop cultures, uh, cultures. Uh, pop cultures. cultures. <laughs> what pop culture has happened to you most recently? Uh, Hamilton. So I, I got... have not seen the actual show. Have you seen the recording of the one that's out? I take it. Uh, yes. Disney Plus. Yeah. Yeah, I made Red watch it. Well, actually, I was planning on watching it, and then Red decided to um, inter interject himself, and then has gone down the <laughs> hole since. But we had the... I did not see nor listen to any of Hamilton, so I went in blind. Uh, I don't know how I managed to live under a rock for the last four years, but I went into it blind, and yeah. Actually, we just did our uh, latest episode. Uh, we do an episode like once a week or so. Uh, and we focused on two of the big film debuts, I guess, for us. Uh, one being Hamilton, and the other being The Fandom by uh, Ash Coyote and crew. I am, I, am a I am very bad at a pop culture. I have not seen The Fandom yet, nor have I seen Hamilton. So I probably need to rectify that. I've heard both are fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Very good. Both were really, really informative <clears throat> and entertaining. Uh, if folks wanted to check out your latest episode discussing both of those things, where what locations can they go to find that or get news updates? Uh, you can actually find us on Twitter, at Grey Muzzle Geek. You can find any of our uh, podcasts, actually, and your favorite podcast listeners. So you can find us on Spotify, Apple iTunes, uh, Google Play, whatever. Um, our main host, I guess, right now is Buzzsprout. So we can find us on there as well. Uh, we have an Instagram page, Facebook page. We're just social media whores, so we're all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in this day and age, the attention market demands everyone to be social media whores. Pretty much. So I don't think anyone's going to hold that against you. Uh, crash. Come back in. There we go. <clears throat> we're gonna come there, back were, to there were a few times where... Uh, either like, you know, I'm hanging out with Xander or other people, and the topic of Hamilton comes up. It's like, oh, we can watch Hamilton! And then uh, we went and looked at the runtime. Yeah, it's kind of... It's a lot. It, I, I am told it's good. Like, the only things I know about that I think I know about it, this might not be true, is that it is a play, but it does have more modern music to it to help tell the story so it's rather unconventional in that regard right, well the big thing about it is it's not your typical musical um even like your classic musicals will have uh your how about you say your, song then dialogue song dialogue blah blah yeah one of one of our friends i believe called it what it's supposed to be is an operetta where from start to finish it's music all the dialogue oh. is in, it's pure music all the way through and because of it, um, it keeps a, a really quick pace going, but then you have modern music. The fact to the point of a major, actually I think all of the cast are minorities, are yes. persons of color, except for King George, fittingly enough is. A badly tuned, very expressive white man. <laughs> hey, he was pretty Wait, 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 badly tuned? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he sings his song fine, but uh, he spits. And it kind of adds to the fact that King George kind of goes crazy at the end of his lifetime. So it's historically <laughs> accurate, but later to find out it's just the actor and he's a spitter. But he does a good job of playing King George. 
You know, I know other people that are spitters, but not like that. Oh. <laughs> so, it's it's definitely uh, something I highly suggest. Like, I absolutely loved, uh, I loved it coming in raw. Um, I definitely say if you're not familiar with hip hop or like even, I don't say soft rap, but just rap and such, uh, watch it with subtitles. Um, it really does help out, especially if you're listening to it for the first time, because it can get pretty dense in a hurry. Uh, to the point of Davi Davis? Davi Diggs. Diggs. Davi Diggs uh, manages to s spit out like six words a second, 160 words a minute. That so, is a lot. So it, it, could, it could be a bit much to take in if you're it, not it's, ready. It's said that if it was a regular play or a regular musical where there is more spoken dialogue, it would have been a six hour play. Wow. Yeah, I need to get off my buns and do right. this. So like I said, that's and that's kind of the stuff we talk about on the show. We kind of dig into some stuff. We have a variety of segments. Usually we start the show with the news. Um, crap that's happening in game news. Uh, again, this week we actually talked about the fact that Eastman and Laird are doing The Last Ronin, which is a Ninja Turtle story set in the future. And uh, all but one Ninja Turtle is dead and you don't know which one it is. And it's actually coming out in August of 2020. Um, we do video game news, comic book news, movie news, uh, furry news, just whatever happens to be trending. And then we go into a variety of segments from down the rabbit hole, which is one of those, hey, Dusty Red's spent the last four and a half hours on YouTube clicking links that take him down <laughs> a spiraling rabbit hole of, you know, again, Hamilton's a good example all the way to adventures that we've taken to um, local breweries we try to support and, and uh, advertise for, um, different locations and different hobbies that we've done. That's another one of the segments. Uh, we just added Yip Review, which we started- You've heard of the at, Yelp Review. Yeah, Yelp, Yelp Review versus Yip Review, which is just us kind of reviewing some certain things. We haven't figured out a scale yet. We need help, like, you know, seven- Three, three barks and a tail or something. <laughs> Um, yeah, we do right down the rabbit hole adventure awaits, which is just us going on random adventures, usually LARP, LARP centric, um, yip reviews. We go gaming, uh, Wait, yip reviews, not Yelp. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, is yip we, like Yelp, but for furry stuff? Pretty much. Kinda. Yeah. We were just reviewing stuff that maybe been less positive. But we've kind of like opened up the door to just reviewing stuff as the fandom or the geeks in us have decided to go to breweries or bars that, you know, we may have had, may or may not have had positive reactions to. Yeah, positive? <laughs> Boo earns! Ah, who am I kidding? I love stupid puns. If I get lucky, I'll get one today. Um, so yeah, it's just a couple of different segments that we have uh, that we just kind of go into. Uh, we we do some news, and it's usually geek related, either gaming or again pop culture, uh, breweries, drinking, those kind of things. We've done a lot of reviews on whiskeys lately, which I know Dragor is a fan of. Oh, you yeah, got me. I immediately want to segue into this. Please tell Absolutely. me about the whiskeys you have reviewed l lately. Um, so, uh, for my birthday, Red's, uh, family actually got me an Arizona whiskey, or bourbon. Oh, they count it, themselves as bourbon, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was Black Mountain. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it was interesting. It was a very cherry-centric, uh, sweeter bourbon. Very good. Uh, so, like... Forgive, forgive me if you, forgive me <laughs> if you, if you do like what I'm about to say. It almost sounds like Red Stag, but good. A little less, little less uh, stag-like. It's the, it's far more subtle notes. It's not like, hey, here's. Hey, punch you in the face with cherry and sugar. No, this is a <laughs> subtle taste to it. Um, we did Ardbeg. I got an Ardbeg ten. Yeah. What did you think of that? I thought it was different. I'm, I <laughs> lean bourbons, but I wanted to try, like a smoky scotch. And to be yeah. fair, Monkey Shoulder trained you into dialing that into that scotch world. Yeah, I'm, Monkey when we reviewed. Uh, Angel's Envy is another one we reviewed. So we just Oh, kinda... Angel's Envy is so good. For, and for anyone who wants the selling point of Angel's Envy, I'm not really a bourbon person. Angel's Envy might 
actually be my favorite bourbon, mainly because it is finished in port casks. So it mm. has that full, round, wonderful, fruity flavor that but helps balance out the otherwise bourbon sickeningly sweet. I knew I liked you, Dragor. <laughs> Angel Envy is my favorite. My favorite, my favorite favorite. <laughs> so Envy Rye. Um, but Angel Envy regular is what Red got me for my birthday. So I, I take on a, a lot of uh, neat pours of my Angel Envy at the end of a long, long day. So yeah, very good. That is that is not a bad way to go. I, I do want to poke a little bit more at the Ardbeg reaction. Oh, now, sure. is that interest like did you like it or is it interesting but you wouldn't buy a bottle she wouldn't um i would it's definitely something that's a, a bit of an acquired taste for sure i've got some friends <laughs> that are scotch drinkers too so it's listen it's, if i wanted campfire i'd just huff a campfire okay well well and sometimes like you're indoors and you can't <laughs> huff a campfire that's why i keep a bottle on hand I mean, yeah, it's, I, I enjoy it. I definitely had a good time with it. It is more of like, it's not something I'm just gonna pour for myself simply because I do enjoy like sharing it with people. It is more of an experience that way. I feel like you just want like to watch people's face as they drink it. No, I, like I won't lie, that's an added benefit of <laughs> sharing <laughs> the drinks I like with people. Like, ooh, I get to see a face maybe. <laughs> uh, it's, it's not bad. I. W from learning, starting to learn what the smell of a whiskey, the, the smell uh, notes of a whiskey, and then taking it in and drinking it mm -hmm. and kind of getting that first reaction. Ardbeg's not bad. It's just not my cup of tea, I guess. Um, I like the campfire smoke of it. It just doesn't, cor it doesn't correlate to the antiseptic taste at the end of it. That, that heavy iodine. Yeah. So, okay. I love all sorts of the incredibly pungent smoky whiskeys, but <laughs> Ardbeg, for the most part, I would personally, I'm an outlier. I rank them pretty low for where my tastes are. So if you do enjoy the smoky side, but want to try different things in that realm, uh, Talisker, I put, I rank very highly. Now there's a little bit of like that iodine seaside part of it, but I feel like it's balanced well with the rest of the flavors. Sure. And then uh, maybe if you don't like the iodine, Koala, I wouldn't recommend. That one's very, very, very briny. Ooh, okay. But See, then it, it costs more. You've probably heard about it due to Parks and Recreation. Yeah, but uh, Lagavulin 16. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I say the, the ones I know is definitely Ardbeg, Octomore, um, Lagavulin. Ooh, Octomore is pungent in the best way possible. <laughs> but these are all experiences Words that we kind of. Words that you normally don't express as positives. Pungent is <laughs> like a con on mon Monday morning. Pungent, <laughs> pungent is not a positive word. But apparently, punching my <laughs> whiskey is a positive. I don't know. But if I want to I... meet a musky husky. <laughs> uh, how long have they been first shooting for? <laughs> and Five <much> minutes. <laughs> so yeah, I, and as you can tell, that's the kind of stuff that we like to chit chat about, just because too many people have a tendency of looking at furry or kind of looking into the fandom from an outside perspective and being like, "Yeah, I'm a furry." Like, okay, cool, me too. What do you want to talk about? And so we like to look into other topics and other things that- Other passions. Other passions that people have. And even to the point of our outro for every episode is a reminder that we are all geeks and to be otherwise is to live without passion. <laughs> so uh, I believe it's Ez who is listening, just changed his name to Positively Pungent. <laughs> oh, yummy. Excellent, I approve. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> if I if I can enjoy it in a whiskey, I guess I can enjoy it in a positively person. pungent oh. perfection. So Ooh. I did want to bring up with y'all now that the official announcement has been made, and I've been tiptoeing around this for mm -hmm. a bit now. Uh, First squared is going virtual. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, despite being the last weekend of February in 2021, the state of the world is such that it is very, very, very unlikely that it will be safe to have that many people gather in one place indoors. Uh, I would like for that to, you know, be changed by then, but right. With our state of the world is that is unlikely. So Absolutely. us weirdos at First Squared are always make the most of it while still being weird. Well, I made the post too. I mean, we are a community slash fandom that was more or less born through the internet. So how does this change things? Like the in-person stuff would be nice, but obviously in the world. So let's use the technologically enhanced advantages that we have between uh, 3D chats and um, live streaming and all these other things. So yeah, I'm, I'm very curious to see how it goes and in a way makes the community more accessible to others who can't make conventions due to, as we see at Midwest Fur Fest, good luck getting a hotel. Or uh, finances. Or, or going to California or, because we're a Midwest base, so going to California or going to Pittsburgh is not a, sometimes an affordable endeavor. So yeah, becomes... uh, well, so like Dragget Show, for example, there's fans from all over in there. And, you know, because we are also, you know, founders of First Squared, the mm -hmm. links between Dragget Show and First Squared run deep, obviously. Deep. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, did a lot of work uh, with the uh, Dragon Show as well. Well, and now some, you know, we've saw it seen posted in the chat. Some people are finally like, "Hey, I finally get to attend First Squared," yep. because as you said, some of those other things that were that are difficult for people that aren't nearby. So yeah, it sucks. We can't be in person, but at the same time, we get uh, a little bit more. There are things we can do now that we couldn't do by strictly being an in-person event. So that's what we're trying to focus on. And I personally give you guys props for being like almost forerunners to saying, hey, we're going to do this. Even it's more than, I guess it's not, it's less than a year away, but it's, it's enough distance from what's going on right now to be in the forefront of going, no, we're not going to be stupid. We're not going to set up a, a set ourselves up for failure and make a last minute decision to do this, you guys are kind of getting ahead of the curve and going, no, we're gonna make the smart decision now so we can be prepared and create the better experience for everybody involved. Yeah, like, you know, I don't know about y'all, but us, we were, we originally, my personal impression was, oh no, the timing of how all of this hit was Anthrocon, one of my favorite cons, was just we gonna be outright canceled yep um, yeah, we were, and then there. to have them come out of the woodwork seemingly with hey we're doing something online uh what they put together with their restricted staff and time resources is kind of nuts if you think about it they put together that whole thing in a matter of a few weeks sure. so we intentionally waited to have our big meeting discussing how we were going to go about our virtual event because we wanted to see what anthrocon did now part of that is because we knew you know between alkali and boozy um myself xander and miko were behind the scenes helping get that set up so we got to see a little bit of the behind the scenes for that uh mm -hmm. everything fur did for them we got to see the behind the scenes for that and we got to see the whole thing play out I call Anthrocon's online thing a success for what it, for the limited amount of time they had to put that together. I'm impressed. Mm -hmm. So now we had our big meeting just this past Saturday before we did the announcement, and everyone is buzzing with ideas. Mm -hmm. Everyone is looking at it, going, "Oh my gosh, we have time to set this stuff up." Had you guys already started to kind of contemplate at that point if that was something that you were going to do and it was only supported by what Anthrocon did? Or was it effectively you had and do it? The way I would phrase it as uh, the staff had known that we were not going to have an in-person event for a couple of weeks. Sure. Um, but in terms of what, if anything, we were going to do in place of that was very much not tangible until basically after Anthrocon happened. Since then, we have all been talking and kind of going nuts and carving out 
what we think we're going to try to do. Everything is still very loose, but the ideas have begun. Now that the announcement is out and in public, we want to hear from anyone and everyone on potentially things they would maybe want to see, want to try, other online events they have gone to or done, mm -hmm. and you know, tell us, hey, I went to this thing and this is what I liked. I went to this thing and this is what I didn't like. Okay. Uh, we really want to, as the saying goes, <laughs> good artists <laughs> borrow, great artists steal. We want to steal every great idea out there and then make it our own. Absolutely. Uh... And we're hoping after what First Squared does, other people see what we do. You know, for as long as this happens, I want the furry community to feel like there is still something out there other than just, you know, looking at art and hanging out online. The oh, tangible sure. nature of the event can still happen even if you're not in person. It's just going to be really different. Well, we call it the R&D, uh, rip off and deploy. So it, it, it works. It's uh, something Another that. Great tag name. If yeah. anybody wants to change. Rip their... off and deploy. <laughs> um, but it's yeah. It, it, they. I mean, once again, they become the guinea pigs because if you watch the fandom, you actually see in the documentary that um, Kage's guidance really kind of took a lot of stuff and went, "Hey, uh, we can't run conventions like frat parties. Like that's not. We're getting too big for that. We're getting too old for that." So they kind of broke the mold in many ways and from it a number of conventions looked at Anthrocon and went okay how do we how do we improve ourselves how do we grow how do we appease those that are near us um yeah MFF is still bigger than Anthrocon in raw numbers but the way Anthrocon's community with the city of Pittsburgh is absolutely fantastic so the, the Anthrocon, up? the big unique factor for Anthrocon really is the integration with the city. I have not been to any con that is at that level. If there are others that have that kind of integration, when cons resume, I want to know because I want to go check them out. I mean, you guys are getting really good uh, with the city of Brookfield in Wisconsin, though. Absolutely. Well, so we do have ties. With, so when I say Anthrocon's like really integrated just by the sheer physical layout and the multi-hotel layout and being in the summer like first squared is never going to be able to ever approach that just because of weather and the sheer distance between everything oh for sure i mean yeah i'm gonna see too many people what, what highway is that right off the hotel street basically <laughs> yeah it's 294 like oh hey chaos is playing that's awesome uh that's my describes my play style in fact uh, a friend of mine, Chaos. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I got distracted by that, and someone's name is Pull My Finger. All right. I got... <laughs> they must know you really well. <laughs> I wonder who it is. Is it oh, you, Ez? No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're, we are genu- like, the staff is genuinely excited, and to a certain extent, I was- I was hoping, I was betting on the excitement happening, because instead of saying, oh gosh, we have to cancel, we're not canceling. We're huh. doing something else instead that still requires the same amount of creativity and thinking out of the box, and- uh, everyone at First Squared essentially has deeply latched onto that and is ready to go. So, hopefully and by, like, the way we announced it, I hope other events are willing to try venturing into this unknown format effectively, and many things are going to fail. Things we're going to try at First Squared are absolutely going to fail, but we're going to try. I mean, it's worth the shot at that point. Like, why not kind of embrace it and see how the, how great you can make it in, 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 it, in its entirety. I'm personally excited. Well, and what y'all were kind of saying before, um, with how furry has grown, this isn't universally true, but uh, it sounds like for us, and especially I'll speak for myself, uh, Furry was online only for me for many years. Uh, I was self-identifying as a furry for, I don't know, four, 
five years maybe before I ever met another fur in person. Okay. I think. So to a certain extent, the age of COVID is a little bit nostalgic to me because it's all online again. Right. I, I mean, yeah, it's. I had a, I, my my furriness probably around 2000, so it was all um, America Online and or um, was it IC or IRQ and shit like that. So it, there was a level of anybody I met was online only. Um, Furry Muck was my big thing, and then Second Life in 2005 became my outlet, and met some nice. good people from there that I still talk to to this day, that I still hang out with at conventions and drink with and, you know, kind of have a chance to meet up. So, yeah, going full circle in a way, everybody's like, oh, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Like, guys, old school furs know what to do. You you young whippersnappers, you not so gray muzzles need to uh, get into our shoes and see how it was when we had to deal with it. And you guys actually have high speed internet, not dial up connections. <laughs> well, yeah, like there's so much more. Okay. So, for example, um, this is the uh, self-referential shameless plug. I am going to be running some form of Doom or some game, what have you, for First Squared, doing either just open play or some kind of tournament with the explicit goal of trying to get 30 to 60 people on a server at the same time. Like those mega LAN parties. I don't know if you've ever been to one or played oh, on those huge that's servers. That's not a thing anymore. It was always, it was always uh, Diablo 2 for me. I mean, they weren't huge <laughs> mega servers but or LAN parties, but there's definitely like five or six people trying to climb on a Diablo, Diablo 2. So yeah, they're, they're not as much a thing anymore. Um, what is the, what is on average, like if you're on a bigger server for the modern shooters, I'm blanking out on the names of them. Um, oh, Overwatch. Whatever. Or, uh, I can't uh, break down the name. Those you're dealing with like eight on eights, if I'm not mistaken. So 16 players. Like um, Fortnite and stuff like well, that. Fortnite, you get 100. Okay. Um, I know Battlefield used to do 64 players. That's uh, right. Uh, I played one of what the one of the futuristic ones, Battlefield 2142 or something. Yeah, I, I used to play that too. That was a fun one. And like, it was just ridiculous. Ooh, okay. Uh, hello to Con. I don't know how to actually pronounce your name. Con React? React? Con React? Conray. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Conrad. Uh, PUBG is another one. PUBG, yep. Uh, PUBG is like one of the big starters for, for that kind of style. Like uh, Fortnite is basically PUBG with cartoons. I'm a bad person. I just went and shot someone who I'm fairly certain was changing their name. Don't was that you, me. Ez? No. Type faster. <laughs> <laughs> Get good. Get good, noob. But yeah, so like either an existing game. Ideally, I want to do it with Doom or something that is open source that requires no money for people to join in on. So to do this, have a bundle, have it ready to go, similar to what we've been doing. The barrier of entry to doing this isn't too difficult. Yeah. Uh, I might make it even easier and build an installer around it. Oh, that'd be pretty cool. But yeah, like, there's no reason. It's harder to do something like this at a convention because it either requires people to bring their own laptops sure. or the convention has to provide them. Mm -hmm. But when you're already home and you have a computer available, suddenly the barrier of entry and probably social willingness of someone to spend an hour or two doing this seems like it would be a lot easier and more receptive, is my guess. Look, I've and had to do, I've had to attend like panels at 11 in the morning on Saturday. I am perfectly okay staying in bed with a laptop, right? And. <laughs> Like, I can right? nurse a hang a lot better in my own bedroom than on a hotel floor in a fursuit going, I need more water. But water means I have to pee. I don't want more water. Hey, uh, now with all these virtual cons, they genuinely can be pantsless cons. I mean, I got a few friends that have been going to work pantsless for several weeks or months. Even. <laughs> that changes nothing. 
<laughs> okay, who is Pube G? Pube G? Probably the person you shot when they changed their name. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, I found Benny. At least I think that's Benny. I found Benny! Uh, and yeah, uh, first squared, it, now that we have had our primary virtual con kickoff meeting and creative meeting, uh, sometime this week we gotta get the messaging together and the intake forms ready, but uh, the open staff call is about to happen. So, there are a bunch of crazy people at First Square 2020 that, that went, Dragor, how do I join staff? And okay. after I finished laughing maniacally, uh, I told him to <laughs> wait for an announcement on our Twitter and website. Uh, yeah, I, I did secret staff. I never really officially staff. I helped out <laughs> with trucks. I helped move things and help uh, Miko guide stuff. And You are in that very wonderful middle ground of... Uh, OG friend for a bunch of us that you don't need the badge, but you show up and staff things get done. I mean, I, yeah, I, it, this year was a little different. I didn't get to help out as much as I normally do, and it was even funny, too, because you guys had things under control, and it's like, yeah, go ahead, do you. And even Dusty, Dusty White here was just like, uh, just go have fun. Like, you don't have to help unload the truck. You, it's you're good. Like, you're pinching in the hallways. Stop it. I, 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 I <laughs> I have very, uh, what are they, terrier type tendencies of, I need a job, I need a task, I need something to do. Work like Fox. Uh, work Fox. <laughs> I like it. Come on, I just, I gotta do something. I, I very much am like that, so that's why I enjoy helping out where I can, or even if I get stuck behind in a panel, like, yeah, can you help bring this over to the next, yeah, let's do it. Like, and a lot of those kind of volunteers and such really... Well, first off, you guys have really grown in your volunteer numbers and know a lot of people that help the convention as well, which is really, really good to see. As, as we all know, your conventions and such are only as good as your staff and as good as your your help. And the fact that you guys have a lot of people who are willing to put in some extra time and basically do what they're called. Like, <laughs> we, have, we have enough chefs. We need some, you know, we need some people just to put that thing over there. Don't question, just do that thing. Well, and there's a difference between the on-site convention stuff where a lot of us do, under, like, I am like that. You know, if if Miko if Miko's doing the truck stuff and I show up, I am no longer con chair Dragor. I am Miko's minion for loading the truck. What? So, like, we all trade. I like to think that First Squared is pretty good about... It's not that you can't give input, it's that sit with us long enough and you'll realize that we try to have the creative spots structured because when things are unstructured, then we lose track of the good ideas. And that's the most maddening part, to sit there and go, oh gosh, I knew someone had this idea related to this thing and you don't have the details. No, for sure, for sure. Like, we've been, uh zoom recording all of our online meetings since obviously meeting in person is not viable and so we implicitly now have these track records you know between the video recording the scribes all of our other stuff going on any of us can refer back and i think we've done a little bit better about trying to invent new things because we're just writing stuff down more all right I mean, yeah, the communication's always been good. And again, because technology's made things a little bit easier to have these conversations, to have these moments of, hey, it's 4.30 in the morning, I just had an idea. Uh, set it up in Google Chat yeah. or, you know, something else. Like, it, it's, yeah, we are in unprecedented times for a variety of reasons. But that's the joys of, as I said, our community being kind of raised by technology and forged by the technology that has also grown with us. So we we're tend to be, if you look at it, a lot of the furry community are programmers, are computer specialists and stuff that grew up you around You just that. shot me in the face. I mean, <laughs> out of all foxes. Um. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> 
set up for actually for uh possibly because that's generally how we all feel so it's all good now first hey. first a champion I was gonna say fur I, I, is our freaking savior right now first first like another secret savior of like I don't know who how many like official badges or official roles that he has but he's in everywhere I look like there's a fur sized footprint somewhere that's like hey he's done a thing or helped out here or made this thing possible we are we are looking forward to the new types of madness we're gonna try and create with this whole virtual thing, and we're gonna try to continue. We're gonna now that we have no choice and there's no in-person excuse for why we don't update the website. Uh, we're gonna genuinely try and do more with it finally. So hopefully. You know, we, we did a little bit of some uh, website world building and also through Twitter as well. So we're going to try and do a little bit more narrative experimentation, I think. All right. Uh, we have Steel. Uh, you know Steel. I uh, know Steel. Mm -hmm. uh, so Steel is... Who was our uh, game master this past year for the right. Conwide game, uh, which also implicitly means lots of writing and theme management. Uh -huh. So, uh, Steel is working currently with our lead website person to figure out what we're gonna do. That's okay. about all I can say without spoiling things. Sure. I realized I started talking about it and went, oh. I have to keep this very, very vague. That does not make for good podcast material. <laughs> Close to the chest. No, no giving away. <clears throat> you got me again. <laughs> so now that we've gone through a few rounds of this, uh, this stirring up any of the old member berries? Uh, I, which is, I'm struggling a little bit because I'm actually one of those people that get motion stickers pretty easily. So Really? Uh, Oh yeah, for whatever reason, that's one of my big fears of uh, virtual reality type stuff. I played it over at Alkali's house and like, definitely had the cross side like, whoop, whoop. Um, I think the game, oddly enough, that got me the most nauseous of all things was the Stanley Parable. Really? It's the uh, tight corridors and the tight um, office hallways that just made things absolutely miserable for me. Uh, any other motion sickness people out there? Pull out your field of view. That helps a bit. It, it started to get me with wrath last night. I'm not gonna lie. Oh, wrath. Yeah, and I'm not even a motion sickness like person. You like, start getting seasick in that game. I, it just it starts to yeah. Some of it, I, the field of vision pulling it out definitely helped. But I am not even a motion sickness type of person, and definitely started to feel that with wrath last night. Um. Yeah. I mean, I played. I didn't play a whole lot of Doom. I played a bit of Unreal Tournament, and then played the crap out of uh, like Rise of Triad and the weird ones. Um, What's your favorite of the weird ones? Now, now I'm really curious. I mean, I think Rise of Triad is really good. That's probably the one I remember the most. Um, was it Heretic? Yeah. It was really, kind of like another clone, but it was you had different spells and a very, very demonic vibe, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, yeah, Tri Rise of Triad had the bizarre weapons and also had that kind of strange strangeness going outside of the norm. Because, I mean, your big players were obviously Quake and Doom, and then Unreal does, Tournament does came Goldeneye around. Count? I mean, Super Nintendo Goldeneye, duh. Uh, <laughs> odd job, slappers only. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Odd job is hacks. <laughs> He's too uh, short. Ah, uh, started with my life, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dusty White's still oh, laughing. Oh, the rocket went through the freaking gate. And Dusty White was still laughing at me anytime. She's like, uh, can you get this off the top shelf just to see me, like, jump on the sink and, like, climb up there? I like to watch him struggle. I uh, well, you've been my friend for several years. That's why. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> affection for the, the physical struggle. Frank. Over always having to fight you witty, wittiness. The, the smarm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, 
to think of other games, but I play a lot of. Well, bro, I, so, I have you had any motion sick issues with this? Because you can widen the field of view with this game engine if you need to. I did to. a little bit. I did a little bit, and uh, there's definitely a couple moments like when I die, I let the spawner go and I pull away for a second. <laughs> I look around the room to kind of reset my brain some. He, he committed to possibly doing, uh, getting some Oculuses for. Uh, for squared last night of when you guys went virtual. We were like, well, we gotta like, in for a penny, in for a pound. If we do a, a Oculus setup, he, he's in for it, I guess. So we'll see how that goes. That is cool. And obviously for those who don't know, even though it has VR in the name uh, for mm -hmm. VR chat, like the headset's not required. All you need is a computer that runs Windows or what have you, and you can join in, mm -hmm. but for immersion and funsies, I won't lie, I want, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do it or not, cause I'm gonna have so many duties running the thing, but I do want Duty. to get a setup to join <laughs> some of the other virtual events that are going on. I'm not gonna lie, Beat Saber looks really sexy. Like, oh, I, it totally I, is. I to play that. Sorry, I got distracted by really wanting to shoot someone. Yeah, that seems to be the thing. Like, it's you I know, focusing Fred hard. Die over and over Look, I'm in sixth place. I'm glad I, don't I really didn't make the shot that with you. I think I'd be dead right now. The spreads uh, haven't been cool. too bad for these matches, considering the number of people that are on these servers. I'm really impressed. You, like, Red was in the, the, the middle heap. I mean, he wasn't dead bottom. Okay, hashtag so. not for all foxes. How many times? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> you do die a lot, though. Yeah. I I wouldn't be any better. I suck at FPSs, so I would be even. I'd just be staring at the the, the ceiling and the floor. The, the floor? ceiling until I died. So, <laughs> at least enjoyable, because I'm not playing. <laughs> I just ate a big green ball of plasma to the face. Great big balls of green behind me plasma guts. <laughs> I'm playing the uh, the main Doom character from the 2016 game. Okay. And uh, I like that one because it has double jump as its passive ability. Except yeah. it's not saving me because <laughs> Wolf Doggenstein 3D just owned <laughs> my face. Wolf Doggenstein. Ja? As ja. if you're playing, if you're gonna name yourself Wolf Doggenstein, then you actually need to be Blakowitz. That is a very fair point. <laughs> or are you gonna stay as, um, I'm blanking out on the character's name. Uh, Caleb. Yeah, I'm gonna stay as Caleb. I do, I should change it up more, but I love double jump so much. I like double jump more than having the BFG ability because there's other characters that have different activated ability. The Minotaur might be my favorite as far as a uniqueness thing. If you've been playing and you've seen a big old Minotaur running around shooting fire at people, Mm -hmm. That is the power up. That is the special ability in spawn from the wizard running around in the red robe. Oh, jeez. Can, can we just talk about the um, genre of children that don't understand what BFB means <laughs> or where it came from? <laughs> Let's go for it. In the in the original Doom weapon slot number seven oh. is the BFG. Now BFG I don't. What? Was it BFG 9000 or BFG? For the start BFG 9000. Okay. What I don't recall from the original game is if they actually spelled out fully what the F is or if it was only implied. <laughs> but it's it's the big fucking gun. Absolutely. 9000. Or big friggin' gun. What's that? Can I, can I have an actually moment? Oh, yes. Cool. Yeah, go for it. Mm, actually, it's Big Fragon Gun. Is that its official name? I believe Taya could uh, corroborate it. It I is the official Taya. name, Big Fragon Gun. 
You're only allowed that moment if you push your glasses up your nose. Oh, I, I am going to do it right now. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> was mimicked that's that's the important part and you were allowed the floor sir <laughs> oh mackie just perforated me with nails <laughs> were they nine inch uh i think officially yes they were uh, yeah. uh, I bet. there's the nail gun in the quake series of games yeah. and that's the deep because, blue uh, weapon slot for one for this one and well, in the original have... Quake, the boxes said NIN on them, Nine Inch Nails, because Trent Reznor also did the soundtrack for that game. Yeah, do you remember that? Wow, that was the center of a gangbang of bullets for me. I mean, as long as there's no bullets, but... All right, there are now far too many Doom guys running around, so I need to change characters. As... Yes? Bad. I know. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna do Duke Nukem, I think. I wanna try this freeze gun. Oh no, oh no, you can't just have it out. It's not ammo, it's a timer. Hey, that was remarkably effective. I froze John Romero. <laughs> John Romero being one of the key people and creators of many of id Software's games, mm -hmm. Doom especially. I have never actually played Dai Katana, and I'm told it's nowhere near as bad as the internet made it out to be. It just kind of overpromised. It wasn't ever a bad game. I mean, yeah, it, I've, yeah, it did this huge build up for a number of years. It took forever for it to even come out. And yeah, John was... Carmacki. Nice. Oh, I love stupid crap. That is awesome. I have frozen chaos in place. Okay. I totally forgot what we were talking about before I got <laughs> distracted by freezing people. I have killed this conversation. Well, I feel like uh, to go oh, I'm sorry, off I fragged this conversation. Oh, nice stuff. I feel like you go off of uh, a group of people that don't know what BFG stands for. You could also go with people that don't know what a land party is. And I feel like, again, that goes right back into first word going digital or I guess, what, what do we want to call it? Like virtual? I guess we go virtual. Sure. Um, there's, I want to see land parties. I want to see people play these big, like you said, do doom tournaments, because that'll be super exciting. I know there's Artemis at First Squared, but that's really kind of the only real... So that topic very much has come up, and we want to do a lot of research into that. So the main... The main issue is as follows. Uh, doing this Doom thing the way it is here is great because we can provide the whole thing open source for free. All right. of these mods are released for free. You don't need the actual still paid for source Doom file for this. They did open source the engine, which is why a lot of this is workable the way it is. Sure. But with Artemis, a lot of people are going to have to buy it, which, right. like, I'm not against people buying things. I want people to buy Artemis because, you know, the people making it, I want them to reap those rewards. Yeah, absolutely. But from an event running standpoint, I want the most, I want the lowest barrier of entry to get the most people able to try out what we offer. So, Makes uh, sense. some of the yep. things we're going to be looking to do is, like, reach out and reach out to some of these creators and be like, hey, is there like a demo or something? Is there a partnership? Can we do like group bundle things where the event sponsors? We don't know. So for the Artemis side of things, like is there a bridge ship simulator that can do ship on ship stuff that, if that. someone could, you know, the whole thing doesn't need to be free. You know, if we're paying for the servers and what have you, great. 
but for the people connecting to the servers. Is there a way to do that where we can reduce the number of people that have to spend? Because part of the consequence of this whole COVID thing is, you know, I know many people in furry that either have reduced hours or lost their jobs because of it. 100%. So we want to make, we want it to be as inclusive as possible. Sturdy two by fur. All right. I actually really like that name. I just got beaten with a sturdy two by fur. I'm now envisioning like a big old muscle bound bodybuilder just walking down the hall, seeing fur, picking him up randomly, and then beating another attendee with him. And I got railgunned in the face. Oh, I'm glad you had gun to that sentence. Giggity. <laughs> Giggity. Under boob Rangoon. Yeah, that's an interesting username. Oh, 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 oh! No! No! Ooh. Minotaur almost fried me. So, I take it y'all have been considering it. Uh, for doing, if you were to do a unique version of the live Grey Muzzle Geekery podcast, have you thought it like, is there any ideas or things you're looking to try that's different other than just live stream podcast? Uh, we haven't gotten too much into it yet. Uh, we're, again, we just got a bunch of new equipment. Um, I was from... like, conveniently, we got some really great a, uh, equipment for said possible live right. podcast. For, we, we, definitely, the, we, we definitely did the, uh, <laughs> when we went shopping for our gear, we actually looked for a port portability for us to be able to just bring our stuff to conventions and stuff. And obviously, again, state of the world, that's not an option. However, um, yeah, we really haven't talked too much about it. Because again, we just got the equipment, so we're still fucking around with how we want to set ourselves up and how we want to set up in general. On top of, like, kind of seeing where things are and what people want. We're very open to ideas and suggestions and very open to kind of what like the, po podcasting is a very flooded market right now, especially with the uh, the, the quarantine that's going on. A lot of I mean, new that's, people started podcasting. That's why podcasting. it took us four months to get our equipment. Well, that and the quarantine <laughs> out in Australia, where all the people built. So you are dealing with an issue of a lot of people are coming out. The market is becoming flooded with a lot of people who have opinions because opinions are like assholes. And <laughs> so it's a it's a case of yay for a market that way. The downside is, is, yeah, it's for competition. It's a lot of, hey, you've got two listeners or five listeners, if you're lucky. And one side says, how do I get more? The other side says, hey, be happy for the, the one or two that you get because they're taking their time to do stuff. So we are trying to come up with some ideas. We're kind of throwing around ideas now. Um, like, I do have a fursuit. I need to figure out what I'm going to do with it at some point. I guess being around my apartment would be interesting. It'll be February, <laughs> so I can leave my windows open to keep it cool. <laughs> Die in your apartment by carpet smothering? Or, yeah, in the catwalk at Midwest First Fest. <laughs> oh, um, you mean the walkway to hell? Or rather, yeah. the walkway through hell? Absolutely. I mean, tomato, tomato, yeah. So, <laughs> um, so it's a case of just, yeah, trying to see where people are. People, they want to see what they want to do. We'll... Right now, we're still leaning on our our typical show with maybe some some guest surprises or something. Uh, we could do something silly, I guess, because we do have Twitch at our fingertips. We do have a, a variety of things that allow us to, again, stay active and stay afloat with the community. But it just really depends on what people want to see, what people want. Um, what entertains people? Bombarding, like... bombarding other people's things, guests showing up Ooh. on other people's stuff. So, from my personal experience from when you were uh, wonderful enough to have me on at First Squared, what I didn't realize, and I think I even commented this on that episode at the time, I didn't realize how much preparation y'all did going into it. Like, watching your videos and seeing how you have the notes, you have your structure, you have research um i very much enjoy having those 
deeper bits of information available if that's where things go. Um, and especially yeah. with regards to doing that in the context of furry and related media as well. You know, there's there's news and there's 60 minutes and everything, but that's fine sure. and dandy. That's that's network TV. That's not our own literal community. So that you guys are doing that, I very much enjoy and find that I don't I don't research every <laughs> single podcast that's out there. So if others are doing that, I'm not aware of them. I also wouldn't use my awareness of things or not as any kind of measure right. if something's right. popular. Well, I mean, I guess for us, I, let, let's call for what it is. Calling a spade a spade. Like, I a lot of my initial podcasts, like, um, information came from um look i like no I, I actually do like numbers i was a fantasy football player and, and like played with the guys at work and you know made some extra money but when i'm at work i don't have the time to just research all of this information about these football players and whatnot so i just listen to a podcast of people saying oh this football player would be doing well or this and that then i started getting into like comedians and they're kind of take into uh, podcasting and whatnot. And Especially then- Especially during quarantine. Well, no, this is like years ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I got into a case of um, working with uh, Dragon Show with uh, Dungeons and Dragons and then showing up on occasion for um, them doing uh, fireside chat. And then even when they did the um, Spread Thy Wings uh, Kickstarter show, a 12 hour marathon. Oh event. my gosh, that was insane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that that really kind of got my interest of like, I want to do a podcast as well, but I want to do it differently from the Dragon Show because as much as I love the Dragon Show, again, Alkali and Xander are old friends. They also go off a very unstructured style, kind of off the cuff, silly humor. And that works. But I also wanted something that was more OCD based. <clears throat> well, I wanted something that was more. <laughs> 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 Definitely something that had a little bit more structure or at least had some information to it and was able to touch on a variety of topics that also makes it easy for people to skip through the episodes. Um, I guess like keeping it conversational, keeping it with some little bit of information, uh, even doing some research with our listeners. It seems like most of our listeners are guys who work desk jobs that just have us playing in their head while they're working. And so they'll tune us out. They'll tune back in. They'll or listen to some stuff. shaving balls, as some other listeners. Yeah. What? Well, <laughs> he was shaving his balls while listening to us. I'm like, I'm not. That person has extreme confidence that they will not be phased by what you say. Uh, that's a childhood friend of Red's. <laughs> um, I can't remember which one, but we'll leave it vague. We're... So, yeah, it's just I, I like the structure that's there. I like being able to pull up information. I like being able to have something more structured and not so much in contrast to Dragon Show, but something that goes in like with Dragon Show of, hey, they're talking about this and this, we'll listen and go, oh, okay, they talked about this. Let's do some research on it. We'll do a down the rabbit hole section on, hey, these guys are talking about a thing. This is a thing that was awesome. We find it awesome because of these reasons. Oh, by the way, here's the technical stats on it. Here's the things that everybody might be more interested in. The, the well, actually moment, so to speak. <laughs> The geekery passion moments, is what we like to call them. So yeah, it, it's, um, and I was looking actually through our stuff now, if I'm not mistaken, for anybody that wants to, uh, who is listening now, our show that we did together, what was it? Ah, there it is. Uh, we did episode 40, we did together. Um, you could find it on your favorite things and your favorite podcast listeners. It's called Achievement Unlock Perform Live. And that's actually the one we did with you, Dragor, um, talking ah. about talking about uh inclusivity in the in the fandom which actually oddly enough we're gonna do again uh in our next show um because of the fandom uh the documentary that came out kind of inspired some other thoughts about basically myself and dusty white who for all intensive purposes would be considered straight you know, mostly straight mostly white you know mostly the gender that we show ourselves as cis and in a, yeah, cisgender absolutely. so so it becomes a case of a uh while we understand that we go into a, a community that is very lgbtq plus positive those that represent that cis kind of get the negative poke sometimes i mean you see it on twitter you see it in in social stuff where you get females that get kind of pushed away or whatnot because of 
you know, this this is only a gay space. Like, mm, no. And that circles back to more of, and when you get to watch it, Dragor, the fandom go, goes almost kind of out of its way to support or um, not support, but represent and showcase. This is one of the major fandom uh, cons that is ran by a female. No, there's only, I think they're saying there's only two, two cons, members dead. There's yes. only two females on uh, convention leadership. Out of however many cons over the United States that are ran or even internationally that are ran that have a con head like yourself at, represented as a female and i i kind of gravitated towards that and like took some pride and and a moment to be like that's kind of fucking awesome like that that's represented where in a normal normal like if i go to first squared there's just some of that that isn't i, I guess representative on my side as a female con chair like that's not something I, I, i've seen or, or well, we do have and you guys do have some good absolutely good staff members too i mean between uh i know ml runs a lot of the stuff now too um kabuki as well so there's a lot of steps being made um which is yeah emil emil is uh director level at first squared mm -hmm. um well then uh similarly related for this uh the harvest moon fur con Absolutely. is getting some good traction we, as well. I, I sincerely hope I am able to go attend that con in late 2022 because, in theory, by then, COVID should be over, I hope. Yeah, we actually just talked about that, too, seeing as they trended with the hashtag socialist teeth, yeah, which became just too <laughs> teeth, fun. Teeth, with. teeth. <laughs> oh my goodness! It, uh, let's sort of make the jokes of like, so we're gonna get uh, Marxist maws and proletariat paws and like all these other things. But yeah, like there's so much that's there that is social consciousness that just be, you can't help but touch into. That will you want to touch and poke at and go, hey, we want to. Oops, I just, Sorry, no. um, just again, something that we like to do. So yeah, episode 40 was the one we did there. We're on episode 57 now. Again, we do about a week episode, a uh, week the episode. Uh, we had a big gap in fall of last year because both Dusty White and I actually were on a, um, a national podcast con competition. Oh, cool. We got to, uh, it was um, America's Next Top Podcaster with Brian Ibbett. And we had people like um, Justin Robert Young, uh, uh, Jenny Jefferson and Scott, uh, Scott Johnson. Scott jo and then who is our coach? Uh, Tom. Tom Merritt. Tom from Merritt. Daily Tech News Show. From Daily Tech News Show. So, like, we got to work with those guys. And in this competition, uh, Dusty White took third place overall. I took fourth place overall. <laughs> uh -huh. You're bragging, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm where I can get them. Okay? Uh -huh. I actually do drink a whole freaking IPA for that one, too. But... Um, but it was definitely something that we beat out some really good. We had, tw it was very uh, like survivor style. You had three teams of four and every, like every week you got tasked to do a podcast, like a, a 10 minute or a seven minute show, be it uh, a comedy show or a news show or whatever. The worst podcast got like judged and then a member from that team got kicked off and it became kind of a survivor series against it. So we didn't know, but Dusty White and I were actually competing against each other for a bit. And then uh, we, entered, we entered thinking we could be a team and then both got picked as individuals. And then we ended up on obviously the opposite teams because uh, yeah. you put you put two of us together and we're going to destroy. But uh, so we ended up on opposite teams and it ended up being fun. Um, it became it, more. Well, that's where a lot of our organization yeah, also absolutely. came from was the lessons that we learned because we got to work with some people who are big time professional like that's their job yeah that's really cool so we got lessons from them to be like hey you know number one rules like why would your listener care about what you're talking about like try to keep it punchy try to keep it entertaining try to say something that they could sit around the dinner table and be like so i was listening to the show today and they talked about this thing yeah. that i'm really passionate about or i really like and whatnot so we try to keep those in mind when we're talking about which is why our show is a little bit tighter written, I guess you could say. Segmented. It's segmented like down, it's, segmented. it's written, it's yeah, written out. Sure. We definitely discuss a little bit before the show of like, hey, you first, me, then you, okay, we'll talk about this. This is our Segway outline. This thing. 
So then we got our sound. It allows us to have goofy sound cues <laughs> and, you know, things that that are, uh, like, I could even do this now. Let's see. Like, we even have... Uh, to, he's, to keep... so, he's so geeked out that he can do this right now. I know, I can do it live. But, like, uh, do when it, we do go it. to our news segment, we have the two different news things. So we got... Ah, oh, there's a sound that brings me back. <laughs> um... Right? Ah, yes, more nostalgia, right in the nostalgia. So that's that's what we try to do as someone who is, you know, the two of us that are in our later 30s now. Uh, I'm pushing 40, and you start looking back and going, yeah, I remember seeing, again, the furry community growing up. And I, I for those that don't know, like, I brought Alkali to his first convention. Yep. We drank and looked around and, like, what is going on here? And... It, and the flip side of it, he introduced me to LARPing, and then we kind of switch paths. I found myself more LARPing on a regular basis, and he just got head over heels, tits over tail, so to speak. <laughs> he didn't have tits back tits then, though. Tits over <laughs> tails. <laughs> but uh, he got big time into the free community, and obviously the well-known entity that he is now. So it... it that kind of viewpoint and seeing that stuff and again if you have the opportunity to see the fandom they have a lot of old footage you should just see it just to see baby kage oh so <laughs> i have but... seen many a uh, old picture and video of him and so... honestly the best part is like it's still him you know just there's there's more hair yeah, that's really the only difference. He had a high look... and tight going on. <laughs> Not quite kid and play, but he definitely had a high and tight going on. You definitely look at it and go, oh, nope, that's, that's Sam Kage. That is baby Kage. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I've seen some pictures of me here and there with uh, hair and glasses. So before, before the balding really got me and before I went and had lasers shot into my eyes. Oh, fair. But uh, I open my trap and it's yep, yep. That's that's that awkward cadence and voice register. I mean, if it helps any, there's definitely photos flo floating around where I did the old, you know, because you did that in the late '90s. I had frosted tips because oh, Ruby baby. <laughs> hey, right now I'm on this whole shtick where uh, a lot of the people I know are just doing random hair things because no one goes out, and if the experiment doesn't work. Oh well, you're, you're... and I'm loving every last one. Someone's like, "Oh, should I do? Should I do like a Spumoni ice cream to my hair?" And I'm, you know, shouting in all caps, "Yes!" And other people are like, "Why would you say yes to that? Like, I have to live through you. I can't do this." So I'm gonna kind of put you on the spot here, Dragor, and maybe as a a segue into our uh, our chat next weekend, um, as a con chair. From the original, I guess, first squared, or I guess I shouldn't say first squared, from the original way that cons were perceived, what do you feel like you've done as a con chair to kind of like segue uh, away from that? Do you feel like what the field has given you the opportunity from what like Alkali has set, set forth? Like, how do you, how do you feel like you've added to setting up a positive community from the, the con chair situation? Uh, to a certain extent, the positivity and bringing everyone in, that mission statement is largely the same that like all of us as first squared founders, we wouldn't have made it the way we did without having some level of agreement on what we were going for. So. To a certain extent, it was the group of us as founders going, there are things that we as individuals and as a tight-knit group liked and didn't like, not commenting on whether they were good or bad, just our personal tastes of what we got out of cons. And the original sales pitch that Alkali gave was, let's make the con that we all would want to go to. So that was the original mission statement. And that had more to do with taste than uh, anything else. Like, I adore BLFC, but I wouldn't ever want to make a BLFC. BLFC is already there. Does that make sense? You don't want to repeat something that's already successful in a different region because A, it may not be repeatable in the region that you're 
uh, essentially, essentially <laughs> trying to make it happen. And I'm just thinking, like, all right, we're all going to Padawanami in Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so like, like just, if I yeah. if to your original question of like, what if I, what do I think I personally have changed? To me, it's more of all behind the scenes, the operational nature of what we do. Um, everyone was telling us this when we went and started a con. It's like, are you sure you want to start a con? It's a lot of work. You you you're gonna risk burning out. Mm -hmm. And we were all high on, fuck yeah, we're going to start a con. And <laughs> it went. And that energy carried us for our entire several first years, sincerely. Because you do the first one, you go, oh my god, that was so much work. We should have listened more. And then the event happens, and holy shit, you we did our con. first con. <laughs> and then the next year, you know, you come out of that first one going, okay. Here's how next year's gonna be different. And then you get to year two and it's like, oh my God, we've done it twice. These things went better, these things went worse. And so that carried us very strongly into year three. And that's where, you know, as we grew, the growing pains are really what settled in. Yeah. And my mentality, as far as like assuming con chair, both for myself and what I kind of saw behind the scenes was, I really need to make sure the staff are having fun because it's really easy to lose sight of what we do as staff. You know, at First Squared, we were founded by a bunch of performers. So it's in our DNA that the show must go on. And that's not to downplay or say other events aren't like that. I can only speak for myself and us that we really took that to such a conclusion that we were very ready and willing to sacrifice our own fun in the name of the event at large. And I think some of that isn't a bad thing, but I do think it went on long enough that people were having less fun. And I personally was having less fun. And I didn't want First Squared to die. I, I didn't. I very much love and adore the event. So the mission statement for me as part of assuming a lot of this was I want to love running First Squared and I want the staff involved to love running First Squared. And so a lot of the work and effort behind the scenes has been geared towards that mission more than anything else. At this point, you know, we're seven years in. We feel modestly confident at being able to put on a weird event that our attendees are going to love. <laughs> we were not good about taking care of ourselves. So that's, the, I guess, kind of spoilers for some of the fandom was a lot of that, uh, a lot of some of, I guess I shouldn't say a lot of some of. You sure but, <laughs> so, <laughs> Some of the fandom goes into that as it started, it goes into the history of how furry con started and some of it was started by people that were just really into this this fandom this world that they decided to build and it started as such a small little get intimate get together and exploded into something that was so much grander than the two people or the two individuals that started it that they didn't know what to do once it had kind of snowballed and turned into this thing that got misrepresented so much further down the line and uh part of the the documentary is con uh uh uncle kage talking about hey this thing was started by two people that were really really passionate about this fandom they didn't know how to be public entities and now it's kind of, again, snowballed away from what it really started out as. And as me, as somebody that came into the fandom so much later into my life and didn't really, under, uh, I guess, understand it until I got into it, it's so refreshing to watch a uh, documentary address some of the things that the outside perspective or the outside world goes, whoa, what is this? And goes, no, 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 wait. This got blown blown out of proportion by the media, basically, or 
outsiders taking a small facet that is the fandom and blowing it su significantly out of proportion. And then somebody like Uncle Kage goes and goes, but wait, there's more. <laughs> we can do so much more as a community and that it is the community. It is the support of um, animal shelters. It is the charity. It is the good nature again community for a lack of a, any better word to explain it of the community is being so supportive and going no this was something that got blown out of proportion by the media because they gravitated towards something that was sensational and you need to reel that back and understand that it's way more than that and he had working with anthrocon specifically kind of like full circling here um, working with Anthrocon and bettering the fact that it's like the top third thing that brings as much money to Pittsburgh as it does. Yeah, I think it's number, oh, it's, yeah. It's number three um, source of revenue. Right. So well, and, and for and Squared, for example, yeah. we are on the radar of the Brookfield Chamber of Commerce just for over yeah. the years. We're at a dead portion of the year being in the tail end of February. We're, we're a convention in winter in in Midwest winter no land. <laughs> hey, it's friendly for suitors though. Let's call for that. Like, I've definitely- uh, yeah. yeah, like in every February. con eventually, like for better or worse, whether people believe or are socially on board with furry or not, uh, the money started talking. You know, whether or not that's an overall good thing or not, it forced people to listen in that, oh, um, well, our businesses did well. And like, yeah, they're weird and we don't get it, but our businesses did well and no one got hurt. So yeah. like, yes, the sensationalism was there, but just by us existing and having our events, it forced people to see that other light. It's, it really uh, makes me happy that the fandom movie gets into that. I'm really interested to see it now, especially. Super. And and uh, we kind of talked about it on our show yesterday. And um, one of our listeners is um, involved in uh, MCFC. And Nisbet was specifically saying um, there's there's such a point of the fandom that talks about uh, Uncle Kage goes into teaching other con chairs or teaching other cons you have to deal with the media but this is how you deal with the media positively versus the media is going to show up and take whatever they're going to walk they yeah want. they're they're going to walk away from whatever they want but you can as a con chair like yourself can spin that positively versus again like you said hey we're here we're bringing revenue we're bringing positivity we're bringing a community we're actively involved in volunteer work let's let's focus on that instead of the bullshit sensationalism that doesn't it, doesn't need to be focused on in fairness it's much like the way you outed me out to my mom uh, i'm sorry about that yeah. Listen, you, I'm sorry about that. I don't know what else you want from me. I can only apologize it for so many times. <laughs> there, there's, uh, I've done a few interviews here and there. Um, one was on site at First Squared. I don't know what happened with it. Uh, the biggest one recently, which was leading up to this year, I did a, I don't know what their listener basis is, but a, Wisconsin, a Milwaukee area radio station I did a live interview on. Mm -hmm. Um my personal, so I've done a few here and there. Uh, I'm basically terrified and scared shitless every time leading up to it. Cause like- As a normal human being would be, yes. Not just that, like if someone were to do a live interview about what I do at Gen Con, I wouldn't really be nervous because yeah, the mind of space of Dungeons and Dragons for the most part, there's nothing they can ask that would be what I would call a gotcha question. Like there is, but the way society has accepted Dungeons and Dragons, those out there questions are more likely to make the interviewer look bad than putting me on the spot. Yeah. Ever the difficult one, and there's been a lot of argument in fandom leadership on how best to deal with this, is the adult side of the fandom. 
Uh, personally, I have never shied away from it. I have never declined or said, oh no, that doesn't happen. But I always answer it in a similar way of like, well, adults are gonna do adult things. So, you know, how much of that really is your business? And there are ways to talk about it where they're not really gonna get a sound bite out of you. The hardest part is making sure that when you are answering truthfully about anything like that, just try as best you can to not give the sound bite. Yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, as far as I'm aware, no one has produced one from me, but I haven't really... <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Uh, I've talked about this a couple of times, but when I was in... Uh, when I debuted the Robbie Sinclair suit at Anthrocon, uh, I was roaming around the dealer den, and this was also the first year that NBC News was allowed in at Anthrocon. It used to be that no media was allowed attendance, especially interviews, to any of these events. And I do believe this was the first year that a news organization with official press passes that was like national news was allowed to be in at Anthrocon. And they saw me and asked to interview, and I said, sure. And goodness gracious, they weren't, they weren't like, um, tabloid news style trying to do gotcha questions, but they were very much trying to get short clip sound bites. The sure. portion of the interview, uh, there were a couple other furry documentaries that this clip was used in. It was what, 10 seconds and they were talking to me for 15 minutes, just trying to get stuff out of me. It very much felt like they were trying to get a sound bite. They were trying to get something that perhaps would not have been the most glowing endorsement of Anthrocon that came out of it. And it's, but it's still everyone who was interviewed for that, like I watched the entire NBC News segment for everyone they had, and it was all very well done. So either it was people saying, you know, not nothing, but mostly it was either neutral statements or glowing statements That's i don't know it. what they were asking the other people but based on what they were asking me i can imagine <laughs> they did not get what they were initially after and i feel like from after watching the fandom that that was a lot to do with what uh, Uncle Kage was kind of starting to put forth with the Anthrocon of, hey, dealing with the media is a thing this community has to deal with, and you need to be prepared for it. And I applaud that. Like, ultimately, it needs to be a situation where everyone puts forth the best paw possible. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah! <laughs> Uh, and so uh, so much for furry adjacent. There. <laughs> <laughs> they put the port, uh, they put for, forth the best pop possible with again, and, and we talked about it yesterday. Where ev there is sex in every fandom. It doesn't matter. If Star, it's Wars, Star Wars, Princess it's, Leia, like, uh, Star ta -da. Trek, Firefly. It doesn't matter what con you go to. There is a sexual nature of every fandom. Comic Con. Uh, well, I, I'm. You have cosplayers that are walking around and going, cosplaying is not acceptance or not... Um, Cosplay is not consent. <laughs> yes. So Which you is have... one of my favorite phrases. Absolutely. 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 There's a level of every fandom that has that sexual side to it or sexualization side to it. And furry shouldn't be held differently. Like, well, and the, way I, the way I phrased it, I was specifically asked that on one of the interviews that I was on and the way I rephrased it is like well it's not that furry or any fandom for that matter has a sexual side it's that we as humans are sexual beings so of course it's going to show up just the same way that anger and sadness and happiness in games it's just how it's expressed in that particular fandom and then I always follow it up with there is less conservative views on those topics in the furry fandom than others. And so, like, it you it tends to work when phrased that way. It's very disarming because then they try to hammer. It's like, ah, but in furry, I'm like, well, we're not talking about furry. We're talking about people. Communities yeah. in general are people. Yeah, for sure. 
And I think it's one of those things that the the fandom does, uh, the documentary goes into specifically saying that furry tends to get more um, people, I guess, on edge because it's uh, cartoon based or are you gearing this towards children? And yeah, that's the... not, that, that, as long as you go into understanding that no, the furry fandom in general goes against that persuasion of going no you need to be 18 year older to view certain things and you need to understand you're an adult viewing certain things that they go against that and it's not guilt guilt uh uh geared towards children like we go out of our way not to gear, gear things towards children and we set up the precedent of no this isn't a thing um I, again uh, any fandom is is open to that i feel like furries get more um under fire for that same same thing because it's animation and cartoon and blah but well, no, and with like no, it, and that's it's ultimately a a conservative argument if you will and it's crept up all throughout media that same style mm -hmm. argument was happening in the 90s with beavis and butthead it's like oh it's a cartoon and cartoons are for kids no a, an art medium is not for a particular group of people it's for who's into it and it's based on right. the writing and presentation um similar things of some of the heart you know rock and roll music back in the day was seen as extremely sexualized and aimed at convert at uh, corrupting the youth mm -hmm. we all know that's not true now <laughs> so like every every Anything that challenges the status quo, if you will, even if it's not doing it on purpose, even if it's just it's perceived as its mere existence as a challenge, really what that boils down to is education. And furry has continued to grow. You know, we didn't die out with the CSI episode. We didn't die out when a person who happens to be a furry made news because they committed a felony. We didn't right. die out when a convention that happened to get in over its head and had to shut down died out because they're all ultimately problems that people are going to have whether or not they're furries. Yep. So, like, the way, from my interpretation, the way people know about furry these days, a lot of that vitriol is just gone because not only have we survived and heard it all and we just shrug it off, but the fandom's grown as well. And mm. as it grows, the the fear of the unknown just inherently drops off. Yeah. And I, I, I personally, as somebody who, again, like I said, got into the fandom late in adulthood, um, I, I look at it and go, if you've ever been in, involved in any type of hobby, find that fandom and see where it leads you. Uh, furry fandom is a great community. It's super supportive. It's um, supportive of its makers, whether it be art, whether it be artists, um, musicians, uh, podcasters like ourselves, um, people that are in entertain it in, in in entertainment. Those the fandom is so supportive of those people that can do and create and make that. I, I support anybody that goes into any fandom to find those cons or find those passionate people and support them because that's how you get that's how you get convention that's how you get sci-fi that's how you get comic-con that's how you get first squared that's how you get uh mff is supporting those creators that go i have this idea i want to support it and you get those people to go i like your idea let me give you things to make that happen Absolutely. The, this whole woke nature of let people like things has just been yes. so liberating for anything creative right now. I love it. I love I love the that culture and that's what I, I feel like even in quarantine, we talked about it on our podcast of if you are working from home, you have that extra X amount of dollars because you're not buying a metro ticket or you're not spending X amount of dollars on gas, take that money and look to support artists and support those people that, I mean, 
<laughs> we just got a sticker pack from uh, MLW. Yeah. Uh, for Telegram. I need to do that. I need ML to do so much art for me if they're willing. Oh my goodness. Because that's, that's, that's just a supporting case of, it. Yeah, that's it was a case of, hey, we got some extra cash. Like, um, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to be working during this time. Oh, I'm, I'm in, you know, healthcare, basically. So, uh, I'm just like, hey, I've got the little, you know, little extra bling bling here. I want some stickers. Like, down? And yeah, the ML just able to spit out some stuff. And there's a little bit of delay, which was great too, because we kept the communication of like, hey, uh, ML had a bunch of, uh, a pretty large queue, because. Uh, Again, some people are definitely taking advantage and have extra money to do that, which is rock on. And so yeah, it's just, it's it's definitely something we definitely encourage for people as well, be it through music. Uh, I, I know we also still support um, Pepper Coyote on Patreon as well. Uh, yes, absolutely. Right. Our, our intro theme song, oddly enough, I can actually play a little bit right now, is from his uh, from his Ma album. Yeah. We actually start every show with this. That's uh, Drive, right? That's absolutely Drive. That's one of Yay. my favorite albums. So we actually start with that and got his permission at First Square uh, two years ago. Um, Talk to him and he's like, yeah, go ahead, use it. And so I think since episode five or four. Yeah, something super early. We had this really generic BS, like <laughs> free audio, da 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 I need real music. I need something. And uh, Mark and Bob, I was like, yeah, as long as you give me some credit for it. I'm like, absolutely. And uh, on top of supporting him on Patreon, um, just kind of jumped on and threw it in there and put his Bandcamp link and all this other stuff so people could support local artists be it music be a visual uh now i'm hearing a lot of people are doing commissions for um the vr chat stuff getting custom avatars on there uh, yeah awesome. so it's it's people that have these skills and people that are willing to show their side or show their hobbies and, and talents and people pay for them might as well make a little bit of extra money and it keeps it keeps the money in house it keeps it in furry stuff it keeps it you, you spend the money on for the guy to do some, like, again, in ML's case, go ahead and make you get their own art, or they could go ahead and do whatever else to keep it basically circulating within our own community. And we're really, really, really good about that. Uh, support support the local, local artists, because they're, they're struggling more so than the average person. And again, um, we go for con, breweries. Con breweries are our thing. Yeah. Breweries and distilleries, we try to go when we can, get gift cards, pick up. A lot of the places have, uh, uh, like curbside pickup. Uh, one of the, actually, there's a group of seven breweries here on the southwest side of Chicago or the suburbs. Did a um, like a scavenger hunt, like a brewery scavenger hunt, where you had a riddle and then you had to go to the brewery that the riddle was like led you to, and then you had to give like a secret word, which is like a second riddle, and then it gave you a new riddle card. And while you're going around solving that, they basically were giving you deals on. Some of their <laughs> I love it. I love it. And okay. so yeah. On that note, uh I would like y'all to give another outro on where to find all of your things since it's been a while of having done that. We have been going about a solid hour and a half. So let's hear it again for the Grey Muzzle Geekery podcast. And where can we find your stuff? So you can find our podcast itself on any of your favorite podcast listening devices and, and locations, Spotify, Buzzsprout, uh, iTunes, Google Play, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Gray Muzzle Geek. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Gray Muzzle Geekery, because uh, apparently character limits on Twitter kind of screwed the pooch on that one for us. Um, we're also on Twitch. Uh, we do our live shows on occasion as well as Grey Muscle Geekery. And yeah, we're kind of a once a week type show, about an hour, give or take. And um, that's kind of what we do. Geek news, geek stuff, and with a bit of a furry spin, but also, again, LARPing, comic books, movies, video games. We, we see what's going on and kind of bring up the highlights. It is, that is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, I'm just going to move all of us over to the main chat, and it'll just be a bit free-for-all, and we get to yell at each other whenever someone steals one of your kills. Sounds good to me. 
All right, bear with me a second. I'm going to do that now. <laughs> 